Um, so yeah, they, they say it's always good to introduce yourself, but uh, I was also told it's better to just like say a story rather than uh, to just mumble about like what you did previously, but I'll, I'll do a bit of that. Uh, so um, just to give you too long to read, uh, I was born at zero years old, um, and fast forward, uh, I turned 18 and started studying uh, logic, uh, which is kind of a merge of pure math and philosophy, um, and I was, I was an idealist. Then I was uh, 20, 21, and for some reason, I got uh, accepted for uh, a job in the Middle East um, where they were opening a new data center for the Central Bank of Oman, so I had to cut my dreadlocks and move to move to Middle East. Uh, I was there for a year and something, and I started a company which had nothing to do with blockchain. While I was studying, like I discovered Silk Road and like crypto and all of that, but it didn't interest me, really. It was just this like magic intern money. It was like I didn't care about like um, finance, money, or anything. Uh, my job in Oman was like fairly technical, but I got a sneak peek into how like the technological aspects of banking works. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I was just doing my, my thing. But then with Ethereum, and I'm also again reiterating on what Claudio said before, I'm uh, super grateful for the Ethereum project uh, starting. And uh, it's also a funny coincidence as this was 10 years ago um, here in Switzerland. Um, and then finally, with like uh, discovering Ethereum 2016, uh, 2015, I started coding in Solidity. I was a freelance uh, dev and uh, auditor for about two years. Uh, then I joined the Ethereum Foundation in 2018. And my, my life flipped again from kind of doing the traditional type of thing uh, into diving into these new waters of actually living in crypto and not just like being on the, on the sidelines. So uh, while I was at DF, uh, I decided to get my salary in crypto. Uh, and uh, that's kind of one of the merits of what I want to cover today. Uh, because I was earning crypto, I was like getting ETH every, every month. Um, and uh, I had a regular, regular contract. I was you know, about to get 30. I was like, hey, let's do the adult thing and let's go to a bank and uh, let's ask for, for mortgage so I can uh, you know, buy the roof that I'm living under. Uh, and to my surprise, even though I was like making a good buck for uh, like a person in my uh, in my age, uh, I got rejected because well, they essentially told me, well, it's nice that you have all these transactions, but that's not real money. I was like, how come? I pay taxes on this. Like, how come this is not real money? But I was like, yeah, you have to prove your credit score. This is risky, whatever. So I so I did. So I like faked having an income for uh, almost two years, basically by transferring bits of crypto on an account, like sending it to the, the, the account of the bank that I wanted to get a mortgage from. Um, and all of a sudden, fast forward two years, I even switched my contract to get fiat. Um, um, the, the internet banking showed, hey, you are pre-approved for this amount. Um, so I was like, yeah, finally. Went to the bank again, everything looked fine. And I got a, got a form in front of my face, which uh, just like where I ticked all the boxes, and was like one extra box, which asked, are you exposed? Uh, do you trade or um, own any cryptocurrency? I was like, well, work for the Ethereum Foundation. There's no way I can hide this. So I ticked the box and boom, that's the end of the story. Um, and I, I got upset. I was like, hey, well, there is this entire world of DeFi. What are we even doing, doing here? And that's how PawnDAO started and Pawn as a, as a project, which essentially targets crypto natives and this like entire cohort of people living in crypto, maybe making their salary from DAOs or from other crypto companies, uh, earning cryptocurrencies. Um, and the target, the goal is to give them access to the same financial instrument, to mortgages. So what we do at Pawn is essentially creating this setup for uh, crypto-backed mortgages. You can imagine like fixed rate, five, 10, 15 year term, uh, loan backed with crypto with no liquidation risk during the fixation. Um, and um, the, the whole motivation was like, hey, this is my story, but there's a lot of people that I know being in the same situation. And there is this entire generation or like cohort of crypto natives. Um, and we got curious about like, okay, so that's the assumption, right? But let's look at the data. Like, let's actually see if there is a there is sufficient cohort that we could build a product for if there is actually enough like demand and money in this thing that we call the crypto native economy. So we started digging into this. Um, so finally getting to the, uh, to the content of the talk here, I'm going to do an introduction of, um, of something that we call the crypto native economy report that we published for a third time now. Um, 
And this is too long, didn't read. This is basically my uh, pitch to get you to look at the 40 something pages that we published on this topic. Um, so first of all, I'm going to start with definition of what the crypto native economy is for, uh, is for us. Uh, then we are going to look into the fees of infrastructure, L1s, L2s, dApps, and then finally say something conclusive. So what is the crypto native economy? We basically looked at available on-chain data. So basically looked at how much, what's, what's the economic demand? Like how much are users willing to pay for using uh, the different protocols, the different dApps? Um, so we separated the report into several uh, um, categories. First look at blockchains as such, and then looked at the actual dApps uh, like DEXs, uh, liquidity provider fees, bridging fees, marketplace fees, royalties, and so on. Um, that's already enough data for it on, on its own, but it definitely wouldn't, you know, I'm sure there is a lot of economists sitting here and it would be like, hey, that's not the whole economy. It's definitely not, but this is what we are capable of doing uh, just now. Uh, so we, what we skipped is basically all of the revenues of uh, centralized exchanges, you know, consulting and like death payments, which is also something that's uh, attached to uh, the crypto native economy. Uh, DAO paid salaries, DAO treasuries. That's also something that comes from my interest from EF because I was looking into how much money it's actually needed for the core development to be secured. Uh, and you can see some of my older talks. Uh, which will give you a glimpse of like how much money there is actually sitting in the ecosystem and how much um, how much is needed to basically cover the entire core development. Uh, we also didn't consider yields um, uh, from uh, basically like lending, even though we actually built a lending lending platform. And uh, something that we didn't include but won't include because we we don't think this actually right fit is mining and token rewards. So basically, uh, block rewards, uh, validator rewards, uh, which are from other source than actually user paid transaction fee. Um, there are some other limitations which you can read in the report itself. Uh, so basically all the numbers that I'll be presenting are denominated in US dollars and because a bunch of these fees were paid in these different cryptocurrencies, um, uh, the conversion is basically considered at the time of the transaction. Uh, this also means that a lot of the data that you will see will be influenced by the price movements that you see on, on macro level. Uh, we also excluded some of the minor categories, but it doesn't really matter, as you will see a bit later. So just a quick glimpse into the 2022 numbers, because we did the report uh, last year already. So on L1s, uh, the, combined, the combined, let's say, revenue was uh, $5.4 billion. 80% of that was Ethereum mainnet. Uh, the DAP fees were around the same um, ballpark, uh, $5.98 billion. And the top 20 DAPs, um, were responsible for almost 90% of all of these fees. Uh, majority, uh, NFT marketplaces. So basically, it was the year where OpenSea made over a billion dollars just on people uh, um, YOLOing into buying NFTs. And the other bigger cohort is uh, the central ex exchanges, mostly, mostly Uniswap. So this is the rough uh, um, split. And again, you can see this in the report itself. So I'm going to stay on this slide. Uh, now, finally, 2023 numbers. Uh, so um, most people that I know of are kind of um, more on the side of like us being as, a, as an industry being in a bull market, um, which kind of sparked last year. Uh, so we actually looked into like, did anything change um, between 2022 and 2023? Uh, can we say it was a, it was a like, bull market start or not? Uh, so what has changed? So we basically saw, uh, we basically saw uh, September and October being kind of the bottom. After, afterwards, like things sparked back, um, and the narratives kind of changed. So what picked up was uh, LSDs, like with staking derivatives, uh, and L2s, and the the narratives that kind of faded away, not completely though, uh, were metaverse and uh, NFT. So basically, mm, part of part of the reason is. Uh, decreased demand. Part of the reason is that there was this like race to zero from all of these NFT marketplaces that basically cut the fees. Um, what we added as well is uh, looking back into 2022 and comparing these numbers across the board. So finally, L1s, there is a slight drop, 17% drop from uh, 2022, uh, $4.5 billion. Um, um, something changed though, something significant changed is that uh, Ethereum wasn't. Um, wasn't as powerful as uh, the previous year. So as you can see in 
uh, September, uh, end, of, end of summer, um, Ethereum was basically overtaken by all, all of these other L1s combined, which, I mean, still means that Ethereum plays a major role in the ecosystem, uh, but something definitely changed there, and we'll get into what that was a bit later. Um, um, so here's just the long-term comparison. You can see that like 2021, 2022 was definitely a much, much bigger year for, for Ethereum, um, mostly because the, the NFT hype, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing to say even. Uh, also, another thing which is quite important has changed, uh, which is good to, good to be aware of, which is, well, a bunch of L2s started 2023. Um, so this is just for, uh, for an anchor, so you can see uh, the, the user base of Ethereum was actually pretty stable, despite the, the, the L2s that picked up. And um, uh, the fees, uh, the fees. I mean, it seems like it's not, but uh, the, the, the fees stayed relatively stable throughout the year as well. Um, now this is the important graph. So this is, these are the L2, L2 monthly transactions uh, versus Ethereum transactions. So as, uh, as you see, Ethereum transactions stay stable. Uh, L2s are picking up big time and basically surpass Ethereum around February last year. Uh, Bitcoin is another interesting, interesting um, phenomenon, uh, which even last year is like basically maintaining a stable base. It's kind of past all of the hypes. Uh, there was definitely, definitely like a price hype or the, the, the hype that follows the price increase. Uh, but otherwise, the, the user base is fairly stable. Um, any guesses what happened in November last year, why the, why the fees picked up? Ordinals. Ordinals, yeah. So that's, uh, that's why NFTs weren't actually that bad. Uh, and uh, this was actually quite significant for uh, Bitcoin as such. Um, did I click the right button? Yeah, this is just a, okay. Yeah, this is just so you can see the, the user base of Ethereum actually stays fairly stable. Um, how we explain this is basically the move of users to L2s. Uh, what was quite interesting is looking at projects like Tron because they actually uh, seem to be reporting um, increasing user bases despite the, the bear market uh, and increased fees as well. And there seems to be an interesting traction. Um, it will be a subject for another report on its own. I'm definitely not a, not a person following Tron all that much. Um, Bitcoin is basically uh, kind of caught up with the rest of the ecosystem, essentially thanks to Ordinals. Um, um, again, the user base has the most like rigid user base, as it seems. Um, another interesting project, uh, BNB Chain, def also one of the ones that has uh, the most users, or at least that's that's what's reported. Uh, the fees were dropping and uh, didn't caught up with the with the rest of the ecosystem. So essentially, um, if your favorite chain isn't in this table, I'm sorry, but these were the only meaningful ones that is actually worthwhile to report on. So um, and you, the, the numbers here are basically the, uh, the user paid fees, the, the user paid the, the revenues on these chains uh, from uh, different chains. So it's essentially Ethereum, Tron, Bitcoin, BNB chain, Avalanche, Polygon, Falcon, and Solana. Uh, from L1 ecosystems, this doesn't touch the L2s. You'll be actually quite interested, interesting to see like how these L L2s would um, play with this. And uh, Anything below Solana is basically another order of magnitude lower. So, um, yeah, you can say, well, you know, fees are super cheap there as well, but, well, the reality is there actually aren't as many users either. Um, so, dApps, finally. And uh, I'll be slightly over time. Sorry about that. We started late. Uh, so, dApps, uh, there was a bigger drop, 48% drop over uh, 2022, uh, $3.3 .3 billion. Uh, so if Ethereum used to be the, the chain from all of the L1s, then Uniswap is the, the DAX of DAXs. So you can see a graph uh, comparing Uniswap uh, versus all of the other DAXs combined. Um, and these are, these are the LP fees. So this was like uh, mostly prior to the fact when uh, Uniswap started charging fees. Um, and again, this is a teaser for you to actually look into the report and like find the tables with the with the numbers. So uh, we also don't have as much time. Uh, liquid staker fees. Uh, so this is an area that was basically new, but started having uh, interesting interesting movements. Um, started to mostly pick up towards the end of the year. Anything weird on this graph? 
Any hunches? Um, Lido isn't there. Uh, and the reason why Lido is, wasn't in the graph because like if it was, you wouldn't see anything. This is basically this like heavily occupied by Lido, and uh, this is like a 50x from all of the other LSDs combined uh, uh, from uh, last year. Uh, the space has changed a lot already in this quarter, so next next report will look quite different. Um, lending platforms, um, despite despite the bear market, like January February, you could still see uh, overall overall demand in using lending protocols and platforms. Towards the end of the year, when the speculation picked up uh, again, a slight increase. NFT marketplaces, again, we mentioned the reasons, uh, mostly decline. You can basically see the the 2022 compared to 2023 in this graph here, you can spot the peak uh, basically getting to getting to around like $2 billion. Uh, L2s are definitely an area which will be interesting in the next, in the next report. And as you see already, a uh, bunch of these L2s uh, can basically compete with a whole bunch of the L1s. Uh, so there's definitely an area of interest. Uh, yeah, I think we're on time now. So, so again, like uh, this was this was just a teaser. Uh, please go to cryptonative.pond.xyz, or I'll, I'll I'll show you a link later on uh, to read the entire report. Uh, give us feedback. What you like to see? What do you feel is wrong? Even we we try to validate the numbers from two sources. The main source is Token Terminal. Uh, the other one I don't remember, but it's listed in the sources. Um, and uh, please also mention like how do you wish this report evolved. Um, so the 2024 numbers so far suggest that 2023 was the bottom for now. Uh, Ethereum is migrating to L2s, uh, and the L2 space definitely is interesting. It's not just the hype around it. Um, the narratives have switched from the, the metaverse and like NFTs hype into the actual core infrastructure. Had a very interesting conversation in London a few weeks back with a guy from uh, per collapse, uh, basically noticing that majority of the people around were actually working on infrastructure and uh, like our own problems, but not really like the consumer facing facing stuff, which is another area uh, which I'm sure is like discussed on other conferences as well. Um, the user base, although is like fairly stable despite the price drops, the difference largely is in in the USD denomination. So like the uh, the amount of fees actually kind of corresponds to the price drops. Um, and yeah, also as you saw from basically having these like top top ones or like the you can say like the the winner take all situations with like Uniswap and uh, Lido and so on, there still is a is a huge opportunity space. Uh, some of these things are very early, and uh, some of these races have started or are are ongoing on especially on the L2 side, uh, but there's still a lot of RS where people can build interesting stuff. Uh, special thanks to uh, Victor, this this French guy right here. Uh, this is this is a this is a picture we took uh, when we left KitKat in Berlin after NFT Berlin, though. Uh, so you can see they wouldn't let us in dressed like this, I guess. Um, and he basically spent a few hundred hours on on the report. Uh, so thank you, Victor, even though you're not here. Uh, and then finally, uh, if you wanted to learn more, if you had to this link, there is a link tree. Uh, with uh, links to the 2022, uh, mid-2022 report, uh, or like mid-2023 report and the final report. And yeah, you can follow us on uh, at uh, PondNow on either Farcaster or Twitter. And if you want, if you, I'm already over time, if you have any questions, I'll be here for the three days at our booth. Uh, so just feel free to come and, and talk to me about this. And uh, yeah, of course, like I'm, I'm expecting there'll be a lot of people uh, from like Tradfi here. So if you don't think this is true, just please talk to me, convince me this isn't true. I've, I've lived through this. So thank you. Everybody. Thank you so much, Joseph.